I want you to take your Bibles. I want you to turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> I'm going to come in halfway through this story, but then we're going to end up back at the beginning of it. Starting with verse 37. And it begins here, and I'm reading out of the message translation. It begins by saying, cut to the quick. Those who were there listening asked Peter and the other apostles, brothers, brothers, so now what do we do? Anytime God shows up in your life, whether it's just an encounter, whether it's God's delivering us from something or healing us from something or imparting something into us, there'll always be a question that the human mind asks, well, where do we go from here? What do we do now? God, you have just brought this incredible blessing or incredible healing or incredible miracle or deliverance. What do we do now? I, I'm, on, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that God never gives something just for us to possess for a lifespan without ever doing anything about it, or certainly without ever telling anybody about it. Anytime God does something in that fashion, he's wanting it to continue and to go forth. David even, King David even said, Lord, deliver me so that I can go out and be a deliverance to others. There was, even, even when you look at the early apostles, when they began to, to carry that impartation, they could not contain it. A lot of times what we try to contain ends up dissolving and becomes nothing simply because we're trying to contain something that must be given away. Does that make sense? If God has put an anointing on your life, it is not for you, and it is not just to be contained within you. That manna that is there will wilt and die unless it is broken and given away. If you think that I, I was healed just to be healed and God just say, yeah, now I've made your body whole and do nothing with it, you're mistaken. Because if you have experienced the healing power of God, now you are accountable to that healing realm and therefore should walk in it moving forward. Thank you for the amen there. Appreciate that. Same way with deliverance. If God sets me free, I am now accountable into that understanding of his delivering power. And because of that understanding, that delivering power, now I must be a voice of deliverance for those who are bound. It just makes sense at all. All right. So he says here, brothers, so now what do we do? And Peter said, here's was the first thing that he said. And, and let, me, let me add this here. Jesus would have said the same thing because he did prior. Peter said, change your life. Turn to God and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so your sins are forgiven. And then he said, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is targeted to you and your children, but also to all who are far away, whomever, in fact, our master God invites. He went on in this vein for a long time, urging them over and over. He said, get out while you can. Get out of this sick and stupid culture. That day, about 3,000 took him at his word and were baptized and were signed up. It's amazing what a heart will do when it, when it, when it comes to the understanding that there is a better life to live in God than what this life in this world can give me. There it says 3,000 in a day was added to the new church. In a day, 3,000. I'm not a numbers man, but when I look at that, I thought 3,000 in a day? We would immediately outgrow this building in a matter of hours. Everyone that, was, that would be doing nothing in a comfort zone would suddenly be ushered out of your comfort zone because you would have to tend and help tend to 3,000 new people. Right. 3,000 added. That's growth to me. It's amazing growth. That day about 3,000 took him at his word and were baptized and signed up. They committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles, the life together, the common meal, and the prayers. And listen to what he says in verse 43. Everyone around was in awe. 
A-W-E. All those wonders and signs done through the teaching of the apostles. And all the believers lived in wonderful harmony, holding everything in common. Wonderful harmony? Divine unity? Imagine 3,000 people coming in today and having to get along with 3,000 different types of personalities. And some of them, depending on how band, band, b- bound they were, may have multiple personalities already that you have to deal with. So essentially, 3,000 personalities could be 9,000 personalities. You see what I'm saying? And yet it says here that they were all in awe and they dwelt in this harmony together. And then it says, and all the believers lived in wonderful harmony and they sold whatever they owned and pooled their resources together so that each one person's need was met. And you know what it says here? Listen to this. They followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple followed by meals at home, every meal a celebration, exuberant and joyful as they praise God. And then it says, people in general liked what they saw And every day, as a consequence, their number grew as God added those who were saved. Twenty-two years of serving God, I have never looked at that scripture like, well, it's just another scripture. In 22 years, and I've read that hundreds of times, not one time did my eyes ever follow on, on that scripture and just think, yeah, that was, that was then, not today. I've never once taken that encounter for granted. Not once. Not one time did I ever think that God could not do that again today. Not one time. Do you understand that this story here, in Acts chapter 2, this this, if you want to call it a sermon with what Peter got, because Peter was compelled to stand up and say, look, I know what you're seeing here. These, these men are not drunk, as you suppose. This awakening that is taking place in this, this wild language and this, this, this visual conception of this fire falling on, this is not, this is, this is not some drunk fest, as you suppose. But this is that which was spoken prior into the book of Joel. So Peter had to get up and give a message because everybody was saying, where in the world, what in the world is happening here? Everyone in awe, everyone in harmony. All these signs and wonders and miracles and and, and all of this, this, this earthquake that we just experienced with God. And yet, in this visitation here in Acts 2, next to Jesus being born, was the greatest God encounter that creation had ever had. You understand? This encounter right here reaches beyond any of the seas being parted. This encounter reaches beyond the plagues that fell upon Egypt. This encounter goes beyond every miracle in the Old Testament. Do you understand? This miracle, this visitation next to the birth of Christ was the greatest heavenly expression that this earth and all of creation had ever encountered. Why? Because it was our opening. It was our... Acts 2 was the church's grand opening. It was our beginning. This was our first inaugural service in Acts chapter 2. It was the beginning of our epic saga, our epic story from the church about the one who was and the one who is and the one who is to come. That was the epic story that Acts chapter 2 
now had. It was the voice that was now within this new manifested expression of God on earth. This, so you got to remember that the earthly mission of Christ had now been completed. You understand? The, uh, 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 it, it, the birth, the ministry, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension, all of that had been completed. It was finished. Jesus' ministry on earth was now complete. And it was now time for the church to begin telling that story. And I submit to you today that it was not the commission for us just to tell the story, but it was our commission and it has always been our commission to demonstrate the story. You tell me a story of your salvation, show me your salvation. You have a story about how you were healed? Show me the healing power of God. You want to talk about a God that takes away your sorrows? Show me your joy. You want to boast about a God that's a God of signs and wonders? Bring me into that realm of miracles. Take my faith there. Demonstrate that God is God. It was time now for the church here in Acts 2. This was our first inaugural sermon. If you remember the first sermon that Jesus preached, if you go back and look at uh, Isaiah 61 and Luke 4, the, the famous words, and we can all quote this, that Jesus gets up in the, in the Sanhedrin and he begins to announce what will accompany his ministry. If you recall what he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to do what? And he, he, he lays out a whole list of what will accompany his ministry. He, he said, first of all, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the good news, not the bad news, not the, not the horrible news, not the condemning news, not the judge. He said to preach the good news. And because the good news that I preach will go forth, guess what will happen? The captives will be released. The blind eyes will be opened. And all of those with broken hearts will be healed. Jesus' message then was to elevate a God and only one God that could fix things that otherwise couldn't be fixed. Now, remember, much of the ministry of Jesus when he was on earth focused on the fact that the Spirit of God was upon him. And because the Spirit of God was upon him, he could see what the Lord was doing and hear what the Lord was saying and then do likewise. In the core of his ministry, this is what he did. The commission of the church has always been bring glad tidings to the earth. Make disciples of nations. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cast out devils. I like what one preacher said. Uh, he said, people ask me all the time, what's the will of God for my life? What do you want to do for God? And they would say, I don't know, I want to be a pastor. Okay, be a pastor. But while being a pastor, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. Well, I want to be a, I want to be a musician. Okay, be a musician. But while you're a musician, heal the sick, Raise the dead, cast out devils. Well, I want to be a teacher. Okay, teach. But heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. That has always been our commission. And the wonderful thing about this commission is that our existence on earth. Now hear me now for a second. Our earth, our existence here on earth as a church, as a body of people, we are here to Punch a hole through the realm of darkness with the light of God. We are to turn darkness into light, upside down. We are to dismantle those strongholds and those ways and those principalities. And we are to be a people that show the earth 
that God can do all things, that in him all things are possible. Now, is there anyone in here today that you believe in a God who all things are possible? Do you believe a God that he can do more than you could ever imagine or even ever ask and believe? Do you, is, there, is there someone in here that you still believe God is a God of signs, wonders, and miracles? Do you believe that God can still raise the dead, heal the sick? Do you still believe that God cast out devils? This is probably the greatest growth scripture that you can ever, you can ever read. You know, we've been on a series now about our, 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 our favor and our commission to grow as people. But when you look at this, this is the most wonderful growth scripture you can ever come across. It says, then they followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple, followed by meals at home. Every meal a celebration, jubilant and joyful as they praise God. And then it says, every day their number grew as God added those who were saved. This was the immediate result of the presence of God now manifesting on earth. And as a result of that, every day it grew. Spiritually speaking, it goes for us as well. When we are born again, the presence of God becomes resident. We too now God should be adding to us every day, virtue to virtue, glory to glory, faith to new levels of faith, healing to new levels of healing. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> but when the church is absent from the spirit of God, guess what happens? Man is exalted. And when man gets exalted, guess what you get? You get man-made doctrines and man-made theologies and man-made ideas and man-made ministries and man-ordained ministries. And the next thing you have is you have a, you have a Tower of Babel church that, 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 that knows nothing about unity at all and knows nothing about, about being collectively called and created to be a family under God. If we are, now, all right, if we are, if, how do I say that, Lord? Thank you. The presence of God came down on Acts, in the book of Acts in Jerusalem. And the wonderful byproduct of that was, is that thousands were added. And then it says that he added daily. There was something resident in the hearts of those that were called into that place called the upper room. And there was a, the, even the Bible identifies it out as saying that they were an all in one accord. And they, w w being in one accord means that they were all in one voice. They were in one spirit. They were in unity. And the wonderful thing that happened was, is that it, it, it the, the result was that God gathered and not scattered. If we are truly telling this epic story, then our story will gather and not scatter. You know what the word scatter means? It means to divide. It means to cause, to separate, or to go into different directions. See, the church, as I said, started with one voice. Now we got more voices and more things that you can think of. You can get anything you want in the church today. Are you here? If you, whatever you want nowadays, you can get in the church, sadly. But wherever we have truth, you'll have an enemy that is always trying to divide you. Always trying to cause separation within you. Forget separating from your brothers and sisters. He'll try to separate you from you. So that you can become a wedged mentality where you don't know one second to believe in this, one second to believe in that. One second to do this, one second to do that. Because you have been divided within yourself. See? But it says every day their number grew as God added those who were saved. Now, the word add here, and the reason I'm just touching on this is because it has such a profound, just the word added, A-D-D-E-D. -D -D. It comes from the word in Matthew 6, 33, when Jesus gave a, a, a wonderful exhortation on how to manifest the kingdom of God. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. 
and then everything else will be added to you. In other words, what he was saying is, if you will seek first the kingdom of God, then I will go back and re-add everything that was you at the beginning. And I will keep adding to it. In other words, I will take, speaking from the church, if the church today would seek first the kingdom of God instead of the appeasement of man, if we would start seeking the kingdom of God, who ultimately has a king to be enthroned, Thank you for that, amen. If the church would go back to a place of where we would seek first the kingdom of God, then Jesus said, I will take the church back to the place of its beginning and add daily accordingly. I will duplicate here, now, what I started then. If the church, will, if God's people will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Not the kingdom of God in our righteousness. Not the kingdom of God and anything else. But notice that Jesus attached the boundary there. Seek first the kingdom of God and his, whose righteousness? Jesus. Seek first the kingdom of God and righteousness. In other words, the blood of my son that will lay out the boundaries, the discerning blood of Jesus. The sovereign blood of Jesus, the empowering blood of Jesus, the, the blood of Jesus that still has the voice. If you will seek the kingdom of God and allow the blood to lay those parameters down and those boundaries of authority down and covering down, then I will add in you now what I added in the book of Acts. Seek first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness. And God said, all of your needs, everything that you need today, tomorrow, and in your destiny will be added to you. It's a powerful word here. When he said he will add, he was saying, I will do now what began at the beginning in you. We got, sometimes in the church we get it backwards because we think that after 20 years of salvation you should be blind and naked and walking in a ditch. <laughs> and that your resume should be, what well, I once was lost, then I got found and put on fire, but then somehow the fire got put out. And now I'm fire retardant. <laughs> it's like Holy Ghost, I dare you to set me on fire. I'm fire retardant. But now in Acts chapter 2, let us begin the story in verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were assembled all together in one place, when suddenly there came a sound from heaven, <laughs> like a rushing of a violent tempest blast. And it filled the whole house in which they were sitting. And verse 3 says, and there appeared to them tongues resembling fire, which were separated and distributed and settled on each one of them. And verse 4 says, And they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit kept giving them clear and loud expression. And now when they were <laughs> then residing in Jerusalem, Jews, devout and God-fearing men from every country under heaven, and when this sound was heard, Think of this now. A sound was heard in the church. A sound was heard in the church. And then it says, and the multitude came together. One translation says, and they came running. They came running to the sound that was in the church. When was the last time you ran to church? When was the last time we were compelled to run due to the sound coming in the church? 
And it says, and they were astonished, and they were bewildered. You know what that word astonished means? It means to be amazed, or to be in awe, or to be awestruck. It literally means to, you're walking in your religious ways, and then boom, all of a sudden, every fiber in your religious being stops. And your eyes fix on what you are seeing, and you are speechless. It's like, whoa! God! And the only sound that you hear is the sound coming from heaven. It means, tell the person next to you, are you awestruck? Are you awestruck with man and man's capabilities and even man's anointing and charisma? Or are you awestruck with Jesus? Does he make you speechless? Does he take your breath away? Does his wonder cause you to just... Holy is God! The people became awestruck at what they were hearing and what they were seeing. They didn't stumble over a billboard with some man's picture on it on their way to church. They, they heard the sound. And they were in awe as they ran. I mean, this was not a ball of fire that people ran from. This was not, this was not an explosion on a, on a side of a road or in a building that caused people to flee. This was an explosion on top of a house that caused hundreds to run to it. A tempest blast. You know what that means? It means sonic boom. It comes from a Greek word dunamis, which means manifested power. It means detonation and explosion. They were praying in one accord and all of a sudden, boom, a detonation went off in the city of Jerusalem. And it wasn't a bomb from a terrorist. Though you might call the Holy Spirit a holy terrorist. A holy bomb maker. Because the Bible says that when the Spirit of God came, it detonated and it, it, it's sonic boom. It, 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 that word sonic boom comes from where, what the, the researchers in the, in, the, in the military in the study said what happens when a nuclear blast at the blast site circumference goes off. It shakes everything. When was the last time our prayer meeting shook the building? And when it shook, people came running from every direction. When was the last time our prayer meeting echoed out a sound into the community? That when people heard, they took off running to the sound. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm telling you this story because this is what happened. A sonic boom is a detonation of dynamite. It, it was, this was a dynamic explosion of something wonderful, not something terrible. When God releases power of this magnitude... Hear me, it's not just for resident power. This is expanding power. This is when God explodes in the glory of God on earth. And then the blast of God pushes the glory into the farthest corners of the earth. It is a, tell the person, this kind of power must go forth. When we as a church fail to change the community around us, it's because we are trying to contain power instead of shedding broad power. We, we, there was a time when the world looked at the church in awe. Do you understand? If you go back and look at the history, starting with the book of Acts, there was a time when, not talking about the religious, even though they showed up too, 
But there was a time when the ungodly had awe at what was going on in the church. Do you believe that? It used to be when someone was sick, call brother, sister, take them to church. They're healing the sick. It used to be that when you were bound, I need to take you to a brother and sister in Christ who have been set free of exactly what you're bound with. It used to be, <laughs> it used to be that the church would listen to the thunder and the message of God coming from the pulpits. Now they subpoena our sermon notes. It used to be a time when the world would look at the church and say, look what they've got. Look what they're doing. They're changing society. It used to be that. Believe it or not, it's part of your history as a believer, starting with the book of Acts. It used to be. <laughs> and it didn't, here's the funny thing, because if you, if you continue on in the story in Acts 2 into 3, 4, and 5, you'll discover that he didn't have to finance no ministry. One day at the gate, one was sick. And here comes Peter. Having come from the upper room, having come now through that blast of impartation and what I might add, the blast of sending out into the world, here he comes. I have no offering to give you. Silver and gold have I none. Let me say it another way. Silver and gold, my friend, is no longer needed for your healing. Such as I have encountered just a few days ago in a place called the upper room. So now I give you. Rise up and walk. Some would say, no, I'll wait for the offering. Keep on going. I'll wait for the change in my can. There it meant to silver and gold have I none. But such as I have now, such as I have possessed, or better yet, such as possessed me now, I give you. There was a time. It's different today, unfortunately. Sadly, we, we foster an, a mentality that says, I want to receive, I want to receive, I want to receive, I want to receive. But no, what about giving? What about giving yourself? You want to be blessed, 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 blessed. What about being a blessing, being a blessing, being a blessing? When we're all about getting blessed instead of being a blessing, did you know that we actually weaken the body of Christ? When we become a bless me club instead of a use me club, we have rendered ourselves as a powerless institution on earth. And I might add this, foolishly we think we can contain the anointing and the giftings and the precious word of revelation that we have been given. And we think that we can contain that and, and be functionable in that and become an elite club in that so that we can be the ones on a, on a foreign distant hill out in the country that's got all the goods while the whole world outside perishes. We think that we can self-contain that. But when we become self-containers, you know what God does? Drains the jar. Let me say it another way. If your jar is full of anointing, you're not using that anointing, don't expect your jar to stay full. I can't expect my jar to stay full. He will siphon out that anointing and give it to someone that will use it. So I told you last week, God boy told me, son, are you ready, for a, are you ready to change your quality of life? Are you ready to possess what they possessed in Acts so that you can do what they did in Acts despite the persecution, despite the isolation, despite the hardship that it may come, and certainly despite what the enemy thinks of it, which we really don't care about that anyway. But 
in me, God, make me a blessing. I'll take your blessing, of course, but God, make me a blessing. See, we can't think that we can, we can, we, 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 we. If we don't give to others, God will stop giving to us. Did you know that during the 40s, if you, if you ever study, I'm, I'm almost done, just actually, not really preaching, just sharing. You know, there's a time in the 40s where the church really didn't know how to handle the healing anointing that just exploded. And, and it wasn't in one man. It wasn't in one ministry or one church, one church denomination. In the early 40s, because of a generation of the people of God praying, People got on their knees and started rending the heavens. God just, woof, a wave of healing anointing that the earth had never seen since Bible days. All of a sudden now is spreading throughout the world like wildfire. And did you know the very, it wasn't the sick that, that had an issue with it. Isn't that something? It wasn't the bound that had an issue. It was what we called the religious church that had an issue with this healing anointing. It's like, whoa, 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 fella. You're going to get up in a tent of 10,000 people and declare that Jesus still heals the sick. We need to, we need to, we need to talk this through, brother. We need to sit, we need to call you to headquarters and we need, you need to sit with the hierarchy and let's talk about this doctrine of divine healing. The persecution that those ministries endured and went through was unbelievable. And it stemmed from the religious church coming against that. Not the people who were sick. They embraced it. You would too. You had terminally ill cancer. <laughs> Listen, if you had terminally ill cancer, are you going to care the squabbling of doctrine behind the scenes? You just want healed. You can fight down the road in a field. I just need healed. And ultimately, that's what happened. You know, Oral Roberts... I heard him say on, on, on during one of those, he said, I did nothing but fall in love with the sick and got persecuted for it. Will we fall in love with a drug addict? Will we fall in love with a homosexual? Will we fall in love with a porn addict? Will we fall in love with, with the one who's absolutely bound and possessed by witchcraft. Will we fall in love with those? Or will we persecute those so that they'll stay away from the church? When Jesus looked at the Pharisees and said, you shut out. You barricade my door shut for, by looking and devaluing the hurting the lost, and the rejected. Well, Robert said, I just fell in love with the sick. And what's amazing is that he fell in love with the sick, and guess what did? God sent him the sick. And that's something that just... Mm. 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 All right. Matthew 6, I'm closing on this. Matthew chapter 6, 33, he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. If you're like me, you'll ask God that question. God, what is seeking the kingdom of God? Do I just get up one day and say, I'm seeking today the kingdom of God? I have finished my pizza, Lord. Now I am seeking the kingdom of God. I have just taken a shower. Lord, now I am seeking the kingdom of God. What does it mean to seek the kingdom of God? How do we seek the kingdom of God? It goes back to what Peter said, the very first thing that he said. And it goes back to what Jesus said, the very first thing that he said. It goes back to John the Baptist, the first thing that he ever said. Repent! Amen. That's it. Repent! Beautiful. How many of you believe repentance is a beautiful thing? 
Oh, repentance. It's like this. <clears throat> Oftentimes as a church, we, as a church, body of Christ, I'm talking now, we often think that repentance is never necessary in our walk with God. Some go as far as demonizing repentance and making it an unpopular thing. No one likes to be told they're wrong, but that's not what repentance necessarily is. Repentance is changing the way you think so that your flesh will do likewise. Repentance is turning from a mindset and turning to the one that will set your mindsets in order. Go into the altar and say, Lord, I'm sorry for what I did yesterday. And then go out and do it today is not repentance. That's trying to ease a guilty conscience. And repentance is not feeling condemnation because that's the other side. The devil tricks up repentance and uses it as a condemnation to get you guilty for doing something wrong. Condemnation can be just as destructive as your inability to repent. See? And if you've ever been condemned, you know what I'm talking about. Because the devil's a master at condemnation. But she used the word beautiful, so I will too. The word repentance is a beautiful thing because repentance says, Lord, forget the mistake for a second. A mistake is a manifestation of a wrong way of thinking. A mistake or a sin is a manifestation of a more rooted cause. I can't change the cause in my own strength and have any long-lasting effect. Therefore, Lord, help me to turn from that root cause. Help me to turn to you so that when you come and the blood comes, I'm made righteous through the blood so that that old stuff no longer has any appeal to me whatsoever. When we repent without, any, without having any intention of changing, you know what that's called? Spiritual insanity. Where you do a motion and expect a different result. That's insanity in the scientific textbook. And I would have to say, Probably, by large, the, one of the biggest causes for the powerlessness in the body of Christ is that very thing. We go to the altar without ever intending to change. God, forgive me of the mess I made today. I'm going to look for tomorrow because tomorrow's a new day. And at the end of that day, tomorrow, we'll be doing the exact same thing. Lord, forgive me for the things that I did. I, I did it yesterday and the day before 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 and the day before. But because I'm repenting now, I'll look forward to tomorrow. And tomorrow comes, the end of the business day or the end of, the, of your work day or the end of your day in life. Whatever time that is, you go to bed, you'll be saying, Lord, forgive me of what I just did or forgive me what I did today. I know it was what I did yesterday and the day before and the day before and the day before and the day before. That is what we call insanity because it is not changing. It's just washing over. This is why, and I'm saying all that because this is why John the Baptist said, look, there is one coming that's going to really show you what repentance is. Jesus came and said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Peter gets up when the kingdom of God just came in a sonic boom on earth. He gets up and says, repent and change your life. It used to be repentance was an ongoing message in the church. It's funny, you go and look, and, and, and look at titles of, of messages throughout most of revivals that you'll see, always there's a tone of repentance. Repentance. Because repentance is not judgment. Repentance is to get us out of the cause. To get us out of the pit. Onto a ground where we can walk and grow and move forward. See what I'm saying? Second thing is, I'm condensing a message in three minutes. Second one is faith. To believe the impossible. You seek the kingdom of God by believing in a kingdom where God is enthroned. All things are made possible. 
and that what you believe produces substance. Faith without substance is hope. Faith, though, according to Scripture, must produce evidence. Am I right? That's Scripture. You don't have to argue with me. That's just Bible, Hebrews 11. It's to set our hearts to the one or to believe in the one who saves, heals, and delivers. Are you here? How many of you believe that in him all things are possible? Tell the person next to you, in him all things are possible. If you look at Acts chapter 11, I love that story because it, it goes through the one, the patriarchs that had faith and demonstrated faith. <laughs> the wonderful thing about those stories is that it landed on Sarah. All of them said they had believed or they believed. Sarah said she believed and conceived. <sighs> Most believe that you, you can see promise or you can receive promise without ever conceiving. You have to conceive a promise to give birth to a promise. At some point, your believing in you will turn into a nursery. You will become, in your faith, if you're believing for something, brother, if you're believing for one thing, at some point, you inside will become a nursery. And you'll begin, you'll begin celebrating as a newborn or a new uh, pregnant mom celebrates when that baby's getting ready to come forth. Have you ever seen mamas who are pregnant, how they glow? Everybody says, oh, she's glowing. And Why is that? You want to know what the, why the glow comes? And, and I know that, that we look at, yeah, they're glowing. They're carrying life. And, they, and listen, the glow is a radiance. It's an awestruck because of the life that's in them. Us men, we don't know that experience unless we've been born again. And we can experience that life within us. Kick it. We just have to look at the mamas and watch the mamas radiate. But I'm going to tell you something. In Acts 2, they radiated because they were in awe of the life that just came down. Amen. Faith, and I'll close with this statement. Faith, when the, the, Peter and all the apostles were no different than you and I. They all came from different walks of life, all different business backgrounds and fields of, of employment. Fishermen, tax collectors, scribes, unbelievers, doubters. There's Yes, I sometimes believe that there is a school where they'll teach you how to unbelieve and there's a business that will keep you employed as a doubter. <sighs> I just graduated from the College of Unbelief. Where do you work? I work at Doubt Co. Oh. But the point being, all of those in Acts 2 were ordinary people that encountered an extraordinary God. And in the encounter of extraordinary God coming down, they allowed their faith to become awestruck. They allowed the encounter and what they saw, what they were experiencing to define their destiny moving forward. I would, have, I would have loved today for Peter to show up at a conference today and have the church argue that the dead can be raised or a shadow can heal. I, I would love to see that and hear that conversation of how we would try to talk Peter or Paul and John into, into the fact that God is not a God of miracles because they, you could not change that within them because they encountered that. They were in awe because of what they were encountering. So they took that experience and went forward. And here is the key. Faith, it says, without works is dead. If there's no works, there's deadness. There's lifelessness. What are the works? 
healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out devils, making disciples of all nations, producing vineyards of fruit within your life, within my life, carrying the anointing, having love, shedding love of, of broad, walking in faith. I can go on and on and on, which, which describe the works of heaven. But here's the key, another key. It's the multiple keys. Faith is the ability for us to go into our future and be in awe of what God has promised and to bring that out of the unseen and say, Rod, you see that. This is what you walk in. Angie, do you see that healing power? Now walk in it. Do you see the abundance of the storehouse of heaven being opened for all of those that believe? Do you see that? Now walk in it. Do you see the God who is the God over everything impossible? Now walk in it and tell the story. Stand with me. It was pretty amazing that those disciples came out of that Acts 2 encounter and single-handedly, what, 70 of them, and literally changed the planet. We're not talking 70 that knitted together and changed a community. We're talking about 70 that changed the world. They advanced the human race. They, they pushed a faith level and this encounter with God who is real, not just a, a, a letter on stone, but a God who is willing to walk among his people and talk among his people. They, they changed the planet and advanced that epic story. That's why I absolutely believe that statement that says the Holy Ghost is in me for my sake. He's on me for your sake. Hallelujah. Jesus didn't begin his ministry until the Holy Spirit came. The disciples, Luke 24, don't go anywhere, fellas. Go to Jerusalem and pray. Get in harmony. Get in one accord and you shall receive power to tell this story to the world. And when that power came, the story went forth. And they changed the planet. Erica, did you know that you can change the planet? Moses, did you know that you can change the planet? Jesse, you can change the planet. The story went forth with that kind of power as long as the people of God stayed in awe. The moment they lost the awe, they lost the power. And the church has been struggling for centuries to get it back. We've done everything that we could do. We've tried filling up minds with scripture and with doctrines to get that power. We've, we've had institutes and, and, and courses and schools and, and impartation conferences to get that power. We have taught gobs amounts of all different kinds of, of theologies in order to obtain that power. But what we failed to know is that you obtain that power by being possessed with awe. That's the source. As long as you stay in awe to God, you'll have unlimited amount of power. Dunamis power. Power that demonstrates God is God. 
the kind of power that can fix things that might otherwise be fixed. The kind of power that gets detonated when people say, mm, only God could do that. It's dunamis power. Sonic boom power. Divine explosion power. This morning, the question needs to be asked. Every single one of us. I've already been asked, the Lord asked me this morning, so I've already been through <laughs> some of what you're about to encounter. Lord, ask me first, son, will you repent? I like repentance. I've, had, I've, I've learned how to love repentance. I found that if I'm not repenting continually, then sin is near. Repentance keeps you humble. Keeps you clean. And then the Lord asked me, will you let your faith produce works? Son, if you're believing just to get, your believing's amiss. Are you believing to give? We can certainly believe God to pour in, but we also have to believe God to pour out. Our responsibility is to tap into what our purpose is. To see, to hear, and to be in such awe of God that we are compelled to go out and do what we've seen.